Okay, welcome back. Uh, got the recording going. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. It is February 1st, 2023, and we will reconvene on our business agenda. We have one matter left before us, and that is KPK docket number 20110261. Um, and so uh, at this time, uh, we have taken evidence and testimony for two and a half days or more. Um, we closed the record on last week, and we continued the matter to 2 p.m. today. And the matter that is before us at this point in time is commissioner deliberations. So with that, um, I would look to my fellow commissioners to determine who would like to start deliberations. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and at the outset, I just want to thank both parties and everyone involved here for their time and attention and work on this matter. Um, it was obviously a lot of information to go through, and I appreciate everyone's hard work on it. Um, and I'll apologize in advance. I have quite a bit to say here, but I'll try and be as succinct as possible and make sure that I clearly get all my points out. Um, there's been some ongoing debate regarding the standard that should be utilized in making a decision regarding substantial compliance of the compliance plan agreement, which I'll call the CPA. I'll note that this commissioner believes the standard of substantial compliance has previously been determined in the June 2022 hearing. Indeed, such a determination inherently occurred given the commission's determination the KPK was not in substantial compliance with the CPA at that time. However, even giving KPK the benefit of the doubt here, I do not believe that it has met the burden to show it is substantially complied with the CPA, consistent with its suggestion that the term means compliance with the, quote, essential requirements of the agreement. I do acknowledge that the substantial compliance does not require exact or complete compliance with the terms of the agreement, but KPK has failed to even meet that benchmark, as I will describe later. Finally, KPK has suggested that certain issues are not relevant to this proceeding, including recent spills, pre-CPA documents, and non-adjudicated NOIVs. I believe that KPK has made these very issues relevant throughout this proceeding, particularly given its assertion that the company has established a culture of compliance and is working on ingraining that culture throughout the organization and its implementation on use of best management practices. That said, my decision is based solely on the contours of the CPA and not these other issues. Um, kind of the way I have this set out is to go part by part through CPA section four. Um, several of the provisions of section four of the CPA are not disputed, including payment of and suspension of penalty amounts and dedicated project accounts, and therefore I'm not going to address those position, those provisions. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the contractor. I acknowledge staff's concerns that Marcom as primary contractor is not supervising all non-technical work and KPK is making technical work decisions contrary to CPA sections 4.2c and 4.2g. While these assertions are disconcerting, particularly given KPK's history of compliance issues, I do not believe the evidence presented during this hearing was sufficient to demonstrate a lack of substantial compliance with CPA section 4.2. Aside from the briefing, the evidence at the hearing did not detail Mark on failing to supervise non-technical work or KPK making technical decisions with respect to the remediation work performed. Should other commissioners determine that KPK is in substantial compliance with the CPA, I would strongly encourage KPK to ensure going forward that these provisions are complied with on a go-forward basis. Next, I wanna talk about the different plans that are required under the CPA. Section four of the CPA mandates that KPK submits several plans to facilitate the remediation and reclamation obligations for the sites identified in the CPA, specifically a flow line system integrity and evaluation and plan, which I believe they called a policy, the comprehensive waste management plan, and a spill, spill release reporting and training plan. KPK suggests that merely submission, submitting these plans constitutes substantial compliance with the CPA. And looking at the language in the CPA, I believe that KPK has achieved technical compliance with the CPA. That said, the CPA specifies that the purpose and intent of the agreement 
namely actions and activities in the CPA are necessary to achieve the closure of remediation projects and are reasonably necessary to promote KPK's return to compliance with the rules. And given that the ultimate goal of the CPA, based on the language and testified to by several witnesses from both parties over the course of the hearing, is to remediate sites and comply with commission rules, I do not believe simple submission of plans is sufficient to meet those objectives. Instead, it is necessary to implement those approved plans to meet obligations. The evidence presented shows that this was not done. First, credible testimony from staff demonstrated that waste is not managed consistent with commission rules or KPK's waste management plan. Second, spills are not being reported timely or properly. During rebuttal testimony, KPK's witness indicated that forms are being filed to progress spills towards closure, but KPK's witness had no response to allegations of reporting delays or errors. And lastly, the flow line plan appears to continue to be a work in progress. This failure to comply with rules or KPK plans does not demonstrate an ability to meet objectives and obligations set forth in the CPA. Despite these concerns, compliance with enumerated plans does not form the sole basis of my decision. Next, I wanna talk about the monthly and quarterly reporting. Similar to the submission of plans identified above, KPK has technically complied with reporting requirements in sections 12 and 13 of the CPA. It is prudent to note, however, that quarterly reports on remediation projects are past due for numerous projects, as I will discuss later. However, exhibits show that the monthly and quarter quarterly report filings have been deficient, including that actions were taken with, that were not always noticed to COGCC staff, Submissions did not include updates, lab results, detailed site controls, or plan details. KPK argued that reports have improved over time, which may be true. Yet even the November 22 report in Exhibit 1003 contains significant notations from staff. Indeed, some of those notations show that work was done without approved work plans and thus were not compliant with commission rules. Aside from the alleged rule violations, and I say alleged because they have not been adjudicated, these issues do not meet the stated purpose of the updates, namely that reports will serve as a means by which COGCC staff and the commission may monitor KPK's progress in achieving the terms and conditions of the plan. Again, the quality of these reports, while concerning and contrary to the purpose of the CPA, is not the sole basis of my decision. So next I'll move on to the progress with the sites. I'll begin by saying that based on the totality of the circumstances, including the issues identified above, I do not find that KPK is in substantial compliance with the CPA. That being said, I do believe that the progress made on site remediation alone is sufficient to support my finding that KPK is not substantially complied with section four. Notably, KPK identified significant on the ground progress as one of their quote, essential elements of the CPA with which it must comply. Looking at KPK's pre-hearing statement, KPK's argument appears to be that it has submitted a prioritization plan and has conducted significant excavation and testing. Testimony from KPK's witnesses further indicated that work and progress has improved since June, 2022. First, conducting work and improving is simply not enough to demonstrate substantial compliance. Indeed, KPK's pre-hearing statement alleges that, quote, the threat to health and the environment at these sites has been largely, if not fully abated. However, this only applies to nine of more than 50 sites. And many of these sites still require monitoring to confirm remediation of potential or confirmed environmental impacts. Additionally, KPK spent significant ink and testimony highlighting that it has excavated almost 46,000 tons of soil and backfilled nearly 6,800 tons. That large amounts of soil have been excavated does not show substantial compliance. It just shows that some work has occurred. It may be that 10 times or even 100 times more soil needs to be excavated. We just don't know. Moreover, the large disparity in excavation compared to backfill highlights that the significant work remains to be done. Leaving open excavation pits, which is testified to by staff, poses a threat to public safety. Some of the backfill approved, even though remediation is not concluded, notably at the Grant Tank battery site. 
And throughout the course of the hearing, I found the testimony of Ms. Graber concerning the status of remediation sites particularly credible. I found it especially persuasive that Ms. Graber not only described the pictures and the work done at the sites to date, but also noted that visits to each site two days before the hearing began confirmed that the descriptions provided were up to date. KPK's rebuttal testimony that Marcom disagreed with her assessment based on visits to the site after her testimony was not credible in my opinion, particularly without providing supporting evidence such as photos to contradict that testimony. Ultimately, I do not believe KPK has carried its burden to demonstrate significant on the ground progress at NOAB adjudicated or GRIP locations such that it has achieved substantial compliance with the CPA. And I'll highlight seven specific points with respect to this. First, despite the CPA being in place for more than a year and many of the sites being open long before the CPA, KPK still does not have implementation plans and or schedules for many of the sites. The Grant Tank Battery is a good example. This site is notable because for among other reasons, it was an adjudicated NOAV, the presence of nearby receptors and the high levels of contamination. Yet KPK is still working on submitting form 27s for implementation schedules and quote, pilot study work plans. The UPRR NOAV adjudicated site also requires, as they, as they specifically stated, preparation and implementation of a reclamation plan that's per their own submissions. Second, for a majority of the sites, we still do not even know what work may need to be done. Exhibits, briefing, and testimony all show that no work has been done on many of these sites. Indeed, when Ms. Graber was asked if remediation on many of these sites would be possible during the term of the CPA, she indicated it was simply unknown given the work that still needs to be done and could need to be done in the future. Given that the amount of remediation that may need to be done could be lengthy, it's problematic that such an assessment has not yet been done to date. As previously noted, and this is my third point, I apologize. As previously noted, KPK has failed to file timely quarterly reports for numerous remediation projects associated with the Global Remediation Implementation Plan for ongoing and unresolved projects. The failure to submit these plans is a violation of commission rules and prevents adequate assessment of KPK progress on remediation sites. Moreover, the failure to provide these reports is inconsistent with the alleged, quote, culture of compliance and demonstrates a lack of on the ground progress at remediation sites. Fourth, the inability to progress with remediation sites in a timely manner is inexcusable. KPK's own demonstrative showed that other operators have had numerous spills since June 2022, and yet only a small number of spills remain open. This is consistent with staff testimony that many spills can be remediated in relatively short periods, either a couple of weeks for spills without groundwater or soil contamination, or for a few months for larger spills. Despite this fact, KPK has many CPA governed sites that have been open for years including sites that should be done in a short amount of time, such as the Nessu site. This delay leads to additional environmental problems, such as wetlands forming in excavation sites and public safety dangers. Fifth, KPK claimed that it made significant improvements to its remediation site conditions by ensuring use of best management practices, including regular inspections to ensure adequate fencing and storage of impacted soil when necessary comes directly from their pre-hearing brief. The evidence presented during the hearing does not support this assertion. Although KPK testified that it has improved fencing and has crews that regularly inspect and repair sites, this testimony was not credible. Testimony and photographs provided by staff show that these problems persist. I again note the credible testimony of Ms. Graber that in visits to sites mere days before the hearing began, many sites continued to have fencing issues, such as sagging, not fully covered excavation, and others. Th these have repeatedly been a problem at these sites. Although KPK indicated daily inspection and repairs are done, testimony and evidence does not support that these are resolved in an expeditious manner, calling into question the implementation of such BMPs. Additionally, KPK's testimony that fencing merely keeps the honest honest is not acceptable. 
BMPs exist for a reason, most notably safety. As a fact finder, I find that BMPs, to the extent adopted by KPK, are not being properly implemented. Sixth, evidence showed that COAs are not being complied with and forms are not being properly submitted. Numerous filings and supplemental information provided to staff is repeatedly missing information required by COA to progress site remediation. Rather than make efforts to improve its process and resolve identified issues, such as those demonstrated in Exhibit 1004, KPK's testimony and argument is that staff is to blame, complaining that KPK cannot complete remediation or speed, speed progress because of staff delays and inconsistencies when reviewing forms. The testimony confirmed that the issues identified that lead to forms being returned to draft are not merely administrative, as KPK would suggest. The duplicative attachment issues identified and spoken at by length prevent appropriate tracking of remediation and formation of plans. What's more, KPK's demonstrative presented during a rebuttal highlights that KPK's problems with submittals. Specifically, even though operators have had more incidents reported in the second half of 2022, some significantly more, KPK has more spills that remain open, particularly after 90 days. While these recent spills are not determinative of substantial compliance with the CPA, it does show that KPK is not making progress with its overall culture of compliance, consistent with staff's evidence and argument with respect to the CPA. Seven, I, beyond timeliness concerns and information submittals concerning CPA sites, I believe that the evidence alone shows that significant progress is simply not being made. Without addressing each site, testimony and evidence showed that excavation remains open at many sites, Many sites have not had excavation begin or forms indicated that additional excavation still needs to be done. Contaminated soil and or groundwater remains, often visible in pictures. Product is visible in non-excavated is visible in non-excavated sites, and monitoring shows that product remains in some remediated sites. Many of these sites are near homes, schools, or sensitive receptors. The sites that stuck out most to me during the hearing, and by no means is this indicating that they are exclusive or the most problematic or vulnerable, are the Grant Tank Battery, the Nessu, the Yoxall Farms, and the James S. Haley. These sites should have either been quickly remediated, such as in a few weeks, like the, like the Nessu, but instead have been open for 950 days, have ongoing impacts that will take years more to remediate despite being open for years, such as the Grant, Grant Tank Battery, they have wetlands forming in the excavation, significant weeds, have had visible product for months, and have even, and even have not received sufficient information after seven return to drafts and offers to waive COAs by staff. The fact that it would take up to seven times and you're still not getting information in correctly with the locations of where monitoring needs to be done is a problem. Testimony does not indicate that staff is to blame for KPK's failure to timely comply. Indeed, testimony and evidence, such as Exhibit 1207, show that leniency is being given to KPK that is not given to other operators. Staff testimony and KPK's own presentation shows that other operators do not suffer from these issues to close spills and releases. In conclusion, seven months ago, the commission found that KPK was not in compliance with the CPA. Over that time period, KPK has hired an EHS executive director and gotten a new project manager at Marcom. Although KPK has argued that it has made attempts to improve reporting, train, and establish a culture of compliance, that is not sufficient. Significant on the ground progress must be made too. The preponderance of the evidence demonstrates that significant progress has not been made at CPA sites. The work done is not progressing, remediation of sites, and in many instances, implementation plans do not even exist. KPK bears the burden to demonstrate substantial compliance with the CPA. While this commissioner acknowledges that KPK has conducted work and made efforts to improve processes, I do not believe that KPK has met its burden for the reasons stated above. Finally, I want to address KPK's testimony that potential sanctions are disincentives which have detrimental impacts to the Colorado economy, the oil and gas industry, 
and the use of the spindle field for carbon sequestration and storage. While I understand the points made, I disagree with the conclusions based on the circumstances faced here. First, the spindle field can still be used for CCUS purposes. K KPK has previously indicated a potential sale of its spindle field assets, and if sanctions are imposed against KPK, regardless of severity, nothing prevents KPK from pursuing the sale. Similar similarly, other operators could take over leases or get a new lease on these lands. Regardless, procedural hassles is not and should not be a reason to, to not enforce commission rules or adhere to our legislative mandate to protect health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. Second, other operators should not view penalties and sanctions as a disincentive to conduct remedial work or avoid investing in Colorado. This is a unique situation. As shown by KPK's demonstrative during rebuttal, other operators do have spills, releases, incidents, but those operators timely report and remediate. That strict penalties and sanctions may be levied on KPK for dozens of incidents that have been open for years should not be a surprise. In fact, severe but appropriate penalties for a unique situation should serve as an additional incentive for other operators to continue remediating incidents in a timely manner, subject to reasonable and appropriate penalties. Bottom line, severe penalties only happen in warranted situations. Third, impacts to the economy. Here, I certainly appreciate that strict penalties and sanctions may have an impact on employment and tax revenue. And my belief that strict penalties be imposed is not to say that such consequences are taken lightly, especially with respect to potential job loss for Colorado citizens. That said, we are still subject to a legislative mandate to consider the impacts of oil and gas operations on public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. This argument only considers welfare. We cannot ignore serious, continuous violations of COGCC regulations and oil and gas sites that have been ongoing environmental impacts for years. Just as the SEC should not seek and impose fines for companies that harm investors solely based on the potential that that company may fire employees, we must not elevate the consideration of some workers above the consideration of environmental and safety impacts to communities or the cost to taxpayers to remediate these sites. More important, impacts of sanctions are not the doing of the commission. Rather, they're due to the actions, or more accurately, inaction of KPK as a company for failing to comply with COGCC rules and allowing unabated environmental impacts to persist for years. Therefore, I find that KPK has not substantially complied with the compliance plan agreement, and I suggest the following relief. First, immediately terminate the CPA. Second, given KPK's inability to cure CPA compliance issues from the June 2022 hearing, all previously suspended portions of the penalty amount be reimposed. Third, KPK be ordered to pay unpaid portions of the penalty amount in full within 60 days. And finally, consistent with Rule 525D2, suspend all of KPK's certificates of clearance and withhold new drilling or oil and gas location permits for six months or until KPK can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the commission that all penalties have been paid and it is in compliance with COGCC rules. If those, if those are not met, then I believe we can take more serious um, action at that time. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Cross, for initiating the deliberative portion of the hearing. Other commissioners with deliberative thoughts? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Mr. or Commissioner Cross, for your thoughts on the subject. That was um, well thought out, and uh, uh, I concur with a number of um, sections of, of 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 your statement. And uh, and so I'll go through mine. And but generally speaking, I think the the evidence citations. Um, that you've provided on the different sections um, are, are going to be similar uh, to what I'm going to provide. And so I would concur from an evidentiary standpoint with a lot of the points that you bring up. Um, I do believe in section three, 
paragraph six of the compliance plan agreement between KPK and the commission, that it clearly states that the commission concluded that the actions and activities set forth within the CPA are necessary to achieve the closure of remediation projects at the NOAV sites where violations were found by the commission and are reasonably necessary to promote KPK's return to compliance with COGCC rules. KPK entered voluntarily into this agreement and by doing so agreed to comply with the elements within. The commission determined in June of 2022 that KPK had failed to substantially comply with the CPA to which it is bound, specifically paragraphs four, five, seven, eight, 10, and 11 of section four. We reimposed, but then again, resuspended the penalty provisions so long as at this January hearing, now February, KPK could show that it had cured its compliance issues. KPK had the burden of proof to make this showing, and in this commissioner's opinion, did not make this showing. And in fact, KPK is still substantially non-compliant with the CPA and the provisions within. The commission deliberated in June and made a clear interpretation as to what constitutes substantial compliance. That interpretation stands today. While KPK attempted to muddy the waters with alternative interpretations, they knew and understood what this commission determined to be substantial compliance and had the burden to meet the compliance standards set forth with the CPA that they voluntarily entered into prior to this hearing. When this commission was lenient and exercising its full penal authority over 14 months ago, it did so with the explicit expectation that this operator would not only come into compliance with the developed compliance plan agreement, but would also come into compliance with COGCC rules throughout its operations. In turn, the operator realized the benefit of significant suspended penalties, significant support and efforts towards developing compliance by COGCC staff, and the operator was able to continue operating within the state of Colorado. This commission and in turn the state of Colorado puts it, put its trust in this operator that they would change their legacy culture of non-compliance into an operation that understood and complied with all of the rules governing oil and gas development within the state, with both the sites incorporated within the CPA as well as their operations in general. This compliance is not exceptional. It is the baseline standard for which all operators within the state are held in order to operate within the state. KPK has shown that they have not been able to accomplish this. Unfortunately, this is a case of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. This commissioner will not be fooled twice. The COGCC has an obligation to regulate oil and gas in the state of Colorado in a manner that protects public health, welfare, safety, the environment, and wildlife resources. Operators in the state have an obligation and a responsibility to follow the rules and regulations put in place to meet these protections. The vast majority of operators within the state take this obligation and responsibility seriously and indeed meet and even exceed these regulatory requirements. As I indicated in a previous hearing, KPK is either unwilling or unable to meet the obligation and responsibility to comply with COGCC rules and the CPA they voluntarily entered into, so reasonable, necessary, appropriate, and significant steps will need to be taken to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources in the state of Colorado. KPK has failed to substantially comply with the CPA on numerous fronts, which I will highlight, but this commissioner finds that KPK has failed to comply with the essential purpose of the CPA, which is to close the remediation sites where violations were found by the commission and to bring KPK into compliance with the rules of the COGCC. The CPA that was developed was in fact to facilitate this essential purpose, but was not developed to create an academic checkbox process that would absolve KPK of meeting the essential purpose of the plan. But in this instance, KPK has both failed to substantially comply with the essential components of the CPA, but also the essential, essential purpose of the CPA to which it is bound. As to the specificity of substantial compliance with section four of the CPA, I can offer the, uh, the following. In paragraph one, which is payment of proceeds, um, I concur with staff and find that KPK is substantially compliant. 
In paragraph two, which is the contractors performing work under the plan, I find that KPK is not substantially compliant. It was true during the June hearing and it carries through to this hearing that there is clear evidence that sites do not have the level of supervision necessary as part of this section. Chains of correspondence between staff and the operator make this clear. There is a lack of full-time supervision of non-technical work, decisions being made on remedial excavation by KPK staff rather than an approved contractor, and that the contractor is not performing all remedial work as per the CPA. In addition, this section clearly states that KPK or its affiliates shall not act as the contractor. So not being properly supervised by MARCOM and KPK or its affiliate KWS making remedial excavation decisions, I find that they are not compliant with the CPA. I will also note that the almost exclusive use of KWS services, a KPK affiliate, as the non-technical service provider has most certainly aided in the lack of progress on sites as the capacity available cannot allow the breadth of work necessary to be accomplished to occur closure in a timely fashion. In paragraph three, which is the dedicated project account, I concur with staff and find that KPK is substantially compliant. In paragraph four, which is the UPRR Pan Am G consolidated number two, I find that KPK is not compliant. Evidence and testimony clearly shows missing duplicative or incomplete waste manifest information, which was confirmed by the operator witness testimony, missing or incomplete form 27s and form 27 supplementals, uh, which also include remediation plans. And while some information was submitted at the last minute prior to hearing, which seems to be a common approach as per previous hearings, it does not meet the burden of showing substantial compliance with the CPA. In paragraph five, which is the soil spread field, I find KPK is not substantially compliant. Evidence and testimony show that KPK is missing background information. There's clear pushback uh, against staff for, clear for their clear efforts to provide support to the operator and a failure to comply with COAs provided by staff to aid in compliance. As to background samples, it is not appropriate for KPK to state that they are at an impasse with the regulator. There is a requirement for determination and KPK has the burden to meet that determination for background levels of metals as requested. In paragraph six, which is the Nestle consolidated, I find KPK is not in substantial compliance. Testimony and evidence shows that this site is one that should have been relatively easy site to reach NFA status given the appropriate resources. The operator is not meeting obligations uh, in staff COAs applied to supplemental form 27s meant to be an aid to the operator in compliance. It is important to note that just submitting a form does not meet the standard of compliance. Forms having accurate information and, and addressing staff COAs and comments to improve the clarity of submissions is essential. This is another example of the operator creating an adversarial environment based on opposition and pushback to staff's attempt to support the operator in its compliance obligations. In paragraph seven, which is the grant tank battery, I find KPK to not be in substantial compliance. Testimony and evidence showed untimely form submittals, lack of notification of backfills, conflicting information, lack of primary contractor su supervision, and lack of compliance with standard stormwater safety and waste management BMPs. In paragraph eight, which is the grip, I find KPK to not be in substantial compliance. Evidence and testimony clearly show lack of understanding of appropriate and necessary BMPs by both the contractor and the operator and why they are needed. Again, there was an adversarial testimony by the contractor when discussing these items proving the concern that staff has indicated regarding the culture of compliance within KPK. It was also shown through evidence and testimony that many reports on grip related sites have gone past due, a significant number of project milestones missed, and many of the sites continue to have impacts to public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. Lack of overall progress on sites, nor any apparent sense of urgency, I find to be incredibly disturbing. It seems rather than trying to get the sites accomplished in an uh, expedient manner, 
more focus is placed on spacing the remediation to go through the entire fifth year of the CPA. Also disturbing is the lack of engagement by the contractor on the shared prioritization list with COGCC staff. Another example of staff continuing to try and support and facilitate compliance for this operator and the operator choosing negotiation, opposition, and an adversarial approach to this attempted support. In paragraph nine, which is the flow line system integrity plan, um, I find that it does appear that KPK has submitted necessary plans, though it is not clear to this commissioner that the plan has been implemented or is being followed. The plan is just a piece of paper unless integrated into operations and followed. So I find in uh, paragraph nine, KPK to be non-compliant. In paragraph 10, which is the waste management plan, I find that KPK is not substantially compliant. For the waste management plan, KPK must not only submit the plan, but in good faith follow and implement the elements of the plan. KPK must do this to be in compliance with the CPA, but also in compliance with general COGCC rules. Evidence and testimony has shown numerous instances of KPK's inability to follow the plan for proper waste management and record keeping, which is critical to the protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. In paragraph 11, which is the spill and release reporting and training plan, I find KPK is not in substantial compliance. While a plan may have been submitted, it is clearly th shown through testimony and evidence by both staff as well as KPK that there have been numerous spills and releases and untimely and inaccurate reporting has occurred, which is in violation of both the CPA and COGCC rules. Uh, different than Commissioner Cross, although I um, appreciate Commissioner Cross's thoughts in paragraph 12, which is quarterly updates, uh, I did find KPK is in compliance, though it is clear to this commissioner that content quality is lacking. I'll conclude with this. While I initially supported the concept of the CPA and at the time thought we were doing the right thing and allowing KPK to show its ability to resolve these issues and come into compliance with the rules, which are the same rules that every other operator in the state of Colorado follows in order to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. It is clear to this commissioner that given the opportunity to comply with enormous staff resources dedicated to support them in this effort, that there is no interest from KPK to do what is necessary to change the culture of non-compliance within its organization to dedicate the resources and attention to resolving the dozens of high priority and outstanding spills, releases, remediation and reclamation of sites within the state and to substantially comply with the CPA. There appears to be more interest in arguing and fighting over legal interpretations of the CPA than actually implementing it. That this confrontational and contentious approach of KPK has stunted the effectiveness of the CPA and that the culture of placing blame and responsibility on their inabilities to substantially comply with the CPA on any entity besides themselves shows that the essential purpose of the CPA will not be able to be substantially complied with by this operator. The fact that this op the fact is is that this operator is a threat to the public health, safety, welfare, environment and wildlife resources of the state of Colorado. And from this commissioner's standpoint, we must take the necessary and reasonable relief as follows. Number one, I believe that the imposition of uh, suspended penalties for paragraphs two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven of section four of the CPA uh, should be implemented to be paid in thirty days. Uh, I encourage staff as one commissioner to terminate the tolling agreement and issue NOAVs as they see fit, uh, to terminate the CPA and impose the remainder of the initial penalty amount to be paid in 30 days, suspend KPK's certificates of clearance until at which time all sites come into full compliance with COGCC rules and refuse to issue KPK any new oil and gas development plans. Uh, that concludes my comments, commissioners, thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Others, commissioners with deliberative thoughts. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. And uh, like others, I appreciate the considerable work that's been done to put this issue before us. Uh, I especially appreciate the comments and considerable insight and detail provided um, thus far by my fellow commissioners. <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of talk during these hearings of KPK's incremental improvement and their associated progress in moving toward a, quote, new culture of compliance in the company, including crafting of the compliance plan agreement, staff's intensive coordination efforts, and KPK retaining Marcom and others to help them along that road. But I wanna be clear, despite staff and this commission's considerable efforts to do so, <clears throat> it is not the responsibility of the people of the state of Colorado to encourage, establish and nurture a culture of compliance within KPK. Rather, the responsibility for compliance sits squarely and solely upon KPK as a condition of continued operation in this state. As compliance with rule of law is the baseline standard as was pointed out by Commissioner Mester, from the inception of a company forward in perpetuity. In other words, regulatory compliance is a definitive requirement from start to finish, not a simple guiding philosophy that is intended to have a built-in ramp up period for an operator while they continue to do business in Colorado. For years, significant good faith and optimistic staff and commission efforts have been made to attempt to bring this operator into compliance, going so far as to include special processes designed solely for this operator dedication of personnel solely to the compliance of this operator and crafting the instrument that is the subject of these hearings, a special compliance plan agreement to help this operator find its way to compliance with state regulations. The bare facts demonstrate that these efforts have been necessitated only because of this operator's historic, persistent and ongoing lack of compliance. Staff is required to do everything it can to help this company be in compliance. Staff has no, have no choice in this matter as they are obligated by our mission to regulate the development and production of the natural resources of oil and gas in the state of Colorado in a manner that protects public health, safe, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. As long as this operator continues to do business in Colorado, staff will continue to be obligated to do everything it can to bring them into compliance and I applaud their efforts. Not only do I not see a culture of compliance in this company or even significant progress toward a culture of compliance, I don't see simple compliance in many cases, which is even more disturbing. Instead, I see what appears to be a history of minimal effort to keep the doors open, reluctantly employing just enough compliance to be able to argue it is doing something to cure its maladies, which arguably demonstrates a culture of non-compliance, a continued culture of non-compliance. Increased scrutiny since the inception of the CPA has necessitated increased compliance by the operator in order to maintain that standard of just enough compliance to make a rote argument that it should be allowed to continue to operate, which is what I believe I've seen during these hearings. To be clear, as was pointed out by others, we do not expect perfection in every instance. That's not a reasonable standard, but we do expect significant diligence of effort toward compliance in every single non-compliant scenario, especially once that scenario has been identified and an NOAV has been issued. Clear and stern direction was given in previous hearings that significant progress needed to be made before today. The operator testified that sites were close to NFA in June. Again, the operator testifies that sites are close to NFA now. The stark realities of no further closures of sites other than one administrative closure on a duplicative technicality, continue to open excavations, sometimes existing for years, and one of the highest rates of non-closures for new spills since June 1st, 2022, definitely do not demonstrate significant diligence of effort toward a culture of compliance. So it, it, my opinions are that prolonging the situation is just not fair to the many other operators doing business in Colorado who willingly employ a culture of compliance to their operations in this state and consistently, responsibly, and proactively exercise it rather than expecting the state to work continuously and consistently with them to create a compliance culture calling it a common goal, while they remain open for business, dragging their feet and or being adversarial along the way. Clearly an exorbitant amount of the state's resources are being spent on this operator at a workload rate that's just not fair to staff, nor is it an efficient and appropriate use of state resources. 
The situation is also not fair to the people of the state of Colorado who rely upon us to set the bar for appropriate protection of the state's health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. These hearings have sufficiently demonstrated to this commissioner that this company is not operating within the parameters of protecting the public health, safety, welfare, and wildlife resources of Colorado, and does not appear to me to be capable of becoming compliant with any degree of expediency. I find no satisfaction in not being able to bring this operator into compliance. Like the director, I feel for its employees and take their well being seriously into account. Unfortunately for them, the continued ability for KPK to operate rests solely within the hands of KPK. And KPK has consistently not employed the resources, funding, and care necessary to attain compliance. And overall, I simply believe it's appropriate to employ a utilitarian philosophy in ruling on this case, which philosophy dictates at this point the greatest amount of good that can be done for the greatest number of people. Um, and so my findings are as follows. Uh, after the evidence presented at the applicable hearings, I find that KPK is too often, but not always, but too often operating outside of the protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources of Colorado. And I find that despite staff's long suffering multi-year efforts to bring them into compliance, this operator's approach remains one of just enough effort to attempt to justify retaining their certificate of clearance. The people of Colorado can no longer shoulder the burden of this operator's continued minimal and adversarial approach to compliance, and that's the bottom line. As the commissioner who sits in the environment, wildlife, and reclamation seat, I specifically find that this operator's lack of, I specifically find this operator's lack of compliance not to be perfect, protective of Colorado's environment and of wildlife, and therefore outside of compliance with our mission, necessitating action on my part. As such, I find that their minimal progress and the more specific shortcomings outlined by testimony, as reiterated by my fellow commissioners, does not comply with many of the principles, nor with the overall intent of the CPA. And I agree with the words of one staff witness that it's just simply time to stop the bleeding. The state has gone as far as it can to help this company operate in a responsible fashion. I agree with the director's reiteration of staff's assessment that we are out of tools. And I want to definitively state that I believe the state has, has more than met its obligations with regard to this operator. However, continued endorsement of this operator's authorization to do business in Colorado does not, in this commissioner's opinion, meet the state's obligations to its citizens. I understand and recognize that these findings have the potential for significant ramifications for KPK, and I do not come by them lightly. Um, I support the staff and director recommendation, and I endorse the relief requested therein. I understand, Mr. Chair, that uh, my two fellow commissioners who have spoken before me have reiterated those recommendations and modified them a little bit, and so understand that we may need further discussion, and I am open to that discussion on recommendations. Uh, and that's all I have for deliberations. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Further deliberations, Commissioner McGowan. You're muted, Commissioner McGowan. Maybe it's best if I just stay muted the entire time. Um, I, I, you know, I just, I feel sick because this is for anyone who thinks that this is an easy decision for us commissioners, like you, it's not. And I understand the gravity of this and the relevance of the decision that we're making. So I just want to start off by saying that this has been a very difficult issue for me in its totality and the deliberative process. Um, that being said, it, it's almost as if we're acting as if all these issues just started with the CPA and we're talking about just what happened in the 14 months. This has been many years in the making, hundreds of days based on testimony from our staff. And there doesn't appear to be a lot of progress made. So I'm gonna read from my notes and some of it is um, I think fairly repetitive just to kind of sum my thoughts, sum up my thoughts. The direction from the commission at our June hearing remains the same. A show of most improved is not enough to show substantial compliance with commission rules. Blaming turnaround time for form 27s appears to be a red herring. 
The original form submittals continue to lack information, have redundant or duplicative information or incorrect information. There appears to be no learning curve or change in how forms are submitted, showing a lack of change in culture of compliance and an attempt to exped expeditiously work to get remediation sites closed. MARCOM is able to point to only a handful of lagging Form 27s out of many that have been submitted and don't seem to seem to take responsibility or acknowledge how long the form stays in their in-basket when it's sent back for corrections. Claims that being treated differently from other operators somehow affects substantial compliance also seems hollow to me. Yes, KPK is being treated differently. They are the only operator under a compliance plan agreement with the commission. They are the only operator that has dedicated COGCC staff to expedite its administrative, technical, and non-technical work. They are allowed to waive certain steps in our rules to help them get work done. We allow them to ask for forgiveness when work gets done without our approval first. There continues to be a seeming lack of unwillingness or an inability to comply with the negotiated CPA. Perhaps the best measure of lack of substantial compliance is that KPK still has only been able to close three of 58 projects 14 months into our agreement. Other operators have been shut down for far less during my time as a commissioner. Even with 10 full and part-time employees at Marcom dedicated to KPK work, KPK still appears overwhelmed by the workload and the various rule requirements of the commission. The forms take too long. The staff is too picky. Directions are unclear. Other operators don't have to do what we do. There are many excuses similar to a non-performing middle schooler. The dog ate my homework, my computer's broken down, I missed the school bus. The onus is on KPK, and if they really thought CP COGCC staff was an impediment to progress for the CPA, this was an opportunity to bring the chair back and to facilitate. This was made clear at our June meeting that we were providing an additional resource from the commission to assure that any speed bumps or disagreements could be addressed. Has KPK made some progress? Yes. Is it enough? Unfortunately, no. Thank you, Commissioner McGowan. Uh, thank you for my fellow commissioners for their deliberative thoughts. Uh, I'm in agreement with my fellow commissioners. Uh, I don't have a typed up manuscript about that agreement, but I can say that I'm tremendously disappointed. Uh, I was the chief author of the idea around a compliance plan agreement. We spent a lot of time because we felt that uh, with it, there was an ability for KPK to prove itself up, that it could return to compliance. But I find that that's not the case. And I realized that it was a five-year agreement and we're only 14 months into it, but we needed to see substantial compliance along the way. And for all the reasons my fellow commissioners articulated, we're not finding substantial compliance along the way. And with that being the case, I would agree with my fellow commissioners that we uh, take and terminate and do the relief as set forth by my fellow commissioners. With that, uh, I would ask AAG Davenport to perhaps visualize himself. AAG Davenport, um, you've heard the commissioner's deliberations. I think there was mostly consistency between the commissioners in terms of the uh, relief that was sought and or the relief that or, or the penalties and associated uh, matters that we want to take. But I thought perhaps if you could summarize for us the areas of consensus, we could potentially get to a motion. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I will do my best. What in listening to all of the commissioners deliberations, where I see agreement between all five commissioners is in the following points. Um, and I'm speaking now about the remedies or right. uh, what to order in regard to KPK. First, uh, I believe there's agreement among all five commissioners to terminate the CPA. Um, second, I believe there is, and, and I'll state this with a qualification, Commissioner Ackerman did support the staff request in their pre-hearing statement, which did not encompass some of the things the other commissioners discussed. And this goes to the next thing, 
That is the suspension of all KPK certificates of clearance. Staff requested that the commission consider that, but did not make an affirmative request for suspension of certificates of clearance. So uh, I'm just noting that. Um, I believe that there was general agreement to unsuspend all outstanding penalties in the compliance in the CPA. And I, I think that encompasses the general categories of, of what the commissioners discussed. Now, there are a few areas that may need clarification. Uh, commissioners Messner and Cross did go through in a paragraph by paragraph basis where they believed there was not substantial compliance and there was one area of difference there in regard to paragraph 12 where uh, Commissioner Messner stated that he believed that KPK had was in substantial compliance with paragraph 12 and Commissioner Cross did not believe that KPK was in compliance substantial compliance with paragraph 12. The other issue, and this was really only discussed by Commissioner Cross and Commissioner Messner, was uh, the timing for how long KPK has to pay those outstanding penalty, unsuspended penalty amounts. My notes reflect that I believe Commissioner Cross was uh, 60 days and Commissioner Messner was 30 days. And then finally, um, our the CPA and commission rules provide that certificates of clearance will be may be suspended. And there was some discussion by commissioners Cross and Messner as to how long to suspend those certificates of clearance or to give KPK the ability to come back into compliance, whereby potentially those certificates of clearance may be reinstated. Not all commissioners discussed that level of detail. Okay, so let's. So we've got uh, consensus around termination of the CPA. Uh, I, while not everyone spoke to it, I believe there's consensus around uh, suspension of these KPK certificates of clearance. If and anyone, since, uh, since uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, since uh, AAG Davenport mentioned me, I wanted to affirm that uh, I support that recommendation as well. Okay, so we've got agreement on that pipe up or raise your hand if you disagree with the uh, effort on my and AG Davenport's part um, unsuspend all outstanding penalties in the CPA and then the issue is with regard to payment uh, 30 or 60 days uh, I'm in favor of 30 I believe that's where Commissioner Messner was Commissioner Cross you had 60 do you want to weigh in on the time frame for payment um I'll, I'll Mr. Chair, I, I think part of the reason I put 60 is I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, ability to pay for some of these things. I do recognize that I believe KPK said they've already put more than $7 million towards it. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we provided plenty of time to, to try and have that happen. I'm not opposed to 30 days. Um, and then I'll just, and while I'm speaking, I'll just make one side note. I also do want to say that I also agree with Commissioner Messner's point that um, encouraging staff to go back and be able to impose an OAVs, I, I think that would be included within the termination of the CPA. Um, but but just to highlight that, I, I agree with that point as well. Hey, AG Davenport, did you have something? I did, and I apologize to Commissioner Cross for interrupting um, while he was talking. I, I would like to note for the commissioner's information in regard to um, payment of penalties and the deadline for that. It's in other enforcement actions, um, I believe the practice is a certain number of days after the issuance of the final written order memorializing the commission's decision as a final agency action under the commission, under the statute and commission's rules, this commission has 30 days from today to issue that final written order. And then presumably there would be a time period afterwards that KPK would, the order would state how long KPK had, had to pay those outstanding penalties. So 
Um, so with that being the case, AG Davenport, what if we were to agree to payment of penalties within 30 days of the final order being issued? Is that? That, that would be clear, I think. Okay. Anybody have a Commissioner Messner? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. That makes sense to me. That's consistent. I put 30 days because that's consistent with previous enforcement actions that we had. And I, uh, I think that that makes sense to have it uh, upon completion of the order. Um, but I did, have, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So when we say unsuspend all outstanding penalties, there's penalties associated with each paragraph of section four. And so there is a discrepancy right now between Commissioner Cross and I that I'm sure that we can resolve here. Um, in that I indicated that um, I believe, believe there was non-compliance with section paragraph two of section four. I think Commissioner Cross indicated that he believed there was compliance in section two of sec or paragraph two of section four. And then vice versa on paragraph 12 of section four, whereas I found compliance and Commissioner Cross found non-compliance um you know having said that if the majority of the commission commissioner mcgowan chairman robbins commissioner ackerman um are choosing to unsuspend all sections then that's one thing but i wonder if we shouldn't go through section by section and just make a determination there because there's dollar amounts associated with each of those sections that can be figured out at a different time. But that's why I went through and indicated that I believe there's, uh, that we should impose the suspended penalties associated with sections two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, and 11. However, if Commissioner Cross, um, you know, you feel strongly about section 12, I think your arguments are strong and the evidence that you bring is compelling. I'm also okay with including section 12 in that. So that would be sections two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. The other sections um, were not being asked for suspension of penalties by staff. And so that was section one, section three, that might be it. And, and I'll just immediately say, I, I think with respect to, to section 12, um, I'm, I'm fine with, with calling it compliance as well. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that I struggled with is there was technical compliance with, with some of these, um, submitting the plans, for example. They technically complied with it, but I don't think it met the purpose of it, which I think is important as well. Um, and, and I think that that's sort of the way that I saw the monthly and quarterly reporting is they did technically comply with submitting the reports, although I don't know that it necessarily meant the, the intent and purpose of the CPA. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to hear what other commissioners thought, but, but I'd be fine going either way on that one. All right. Uh, other commissioners desire to weigh in on paragraph two and 12. Commissioner Ackerman. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to do so, and I appreciate um, Commissioners Cross and Messner um, itemizing these. Uh, just taking one step back, I do feel that it's appropriate to itemize these as we talk about penalties going forward, and so I appreciate that. And I, I, I think I just wanted to state that I, while while there was a little discrepancy between the two positions that were enumerated, I, I believe that they both, uh, I believe that they both expressed valid claims of non-compliance associated with portions of those points. And so my leaning would be to call the both of those points non-compliant. Yeah, well, thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. I think I would agree with that point uh, that you made on both two and 12. Uh, so AAG Davenport, getting back to kind of the list, um, where are we at? So I believe then we have at least three commissioners who would agree with that there was not substantial compliance with paragraphs 
2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. I think I should just say 2 and then 4 through 12, if I'm reading that accurately, which would equate to unsuspending the penalties associated with those paragraphs and requiring KPK to pay that amount of the final written order, we'll do the math correctly, hopefully, uh, within 30 days of issuance of the final written order. Okay. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So that's one section of the suspended penalties. The other piece that I had brought up at least that I thought maybe we would um, discuss is there was initial, an initial penalty amount of $795,000, which was to be paid incrementally over five years. Um, I'm suggesting that we also impose the remainder of the initial penalty amount of $795,000 within the same time frame as we discussed uh, for the different paragraphs of section four. Agreed. Agreed. I'm supportive as well. Okay, so I'm making a list on my notes here. I'm underlining the things in which we've got agreement. I just underlined that point as well. Um, so I've got uh, that the CPA is terminated, uh, the suspension of all KPK certificates of completion of clearance and AAG Davenport, that suspension remains in effect until there's a question mark after that until. Oh, I have a question mark in regard to that as well. I think that was I previously hopefully mentioned that I there were there was some discussion of the until by Commissioners Cross and Messner, but um, not exact agreement on the until. Um, I think Commissioner Messner, hopefully I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, said until KPK comes into compliance, Commissioner Cross provided KPK with six months to come into compliance and have their certificates of clearance reinstated. Mr. Chair, I, I mean, I had indicated um, that um, that we suspend KPK certificate of clearance until all sites come into full compliance with COGCC rules. Um, I guess I would like to hear from Commissioner Cross. I'm not sure the six month piece, I guess. And so maybe you could elaborate on why six, I guess I was just a little confused on the six month. Are you saying that they have to come into compliance within six months? And if it goes beyond that, then there's some, that it's permanently revoked their suspension of clearance? Or I guess I was a little unsure about Absolutely, and I'm and I'm happy to speak to that. I, I think one of the things that I wanted to make sure we do is is not leave this open ended. Um, I think inherently one of the things that I struggle with from a policy decision in this situation is trying to encourage KPK to to remediate these sites. I I don't want them to go into our open well system, um, and, and I think the idea of putting a time frame around it. Um, and, and open to talking about it is to provide them ample time to work on getting these sites into compliance, um, but not leaving it open ended such that, you know, three years from now, we're, we're still waiting for this to happen um, and, and heels are being drug and we're not seeing that compliance coming into effect. So it, it was more so to provide a time certain with which action should be taken um, to make sure that this is providing that incentive. And, and if it's not met, then you know additional actions could be taken, such as revoking licenses to operate. Mr. Master. I, I mean, I think I'm okay with that. I don't think it's uh, substantially different. I see your points as far as making the time certain, and I but I do think that there has to be clarity as far as what actions are after six months, right? Um, uh, the further action. So I, Meg, I think, again, what I'm hearing you say is a suspension of certificates of clearance, um, which means the operator can't sell product, um, can't operate their wells, have to, um, but have to continue with their 
remediation efforts in order to be in compliance with COGCC rules. Um, but you're giving them six months to come into full compliance with COGCC rules. Should they not come into compliance at the end of six months, then the revocation of the license to operate in the state of Colorado. Is that what I'm hearing? Commissioner Cross. Apologies, I, that, that's correct. And if, and if others have an idea on different amounts of time, I'd also be open to, to discussing that as well. But but yes, that, that is correct, Commissioner Messing. So AG Davenport, do you wanna re-articulate <laughs> Commissioner Messner's articulation of Commissioner Cross's thoughts so that we're all on the same page, at least with regard to the supposal from Commissioner Cross. Yes, do you want me to go through the full list of everything or just this last piece? Let's just do this last piece. I think we've got, we've hammered down on the others. Okay. So, so and um, just like maybe tell us the, the two approaches between Messner and Cross. Okay, I, I, I do believe Commissioner Messner said he was at least in concept, fine with Commissioner Cross's proposal. So, um, so uh, Commissioner, art, yeah, sorry, articulate, so articulate Cross first, then. Okay, Commissioner Cross's proposal was to, and this all commissioners are agreeing with this, to immediately suspend KPK all of KPK certificates of clearance, but that KPK would have six months to full come into full compliance with Commission's rules at all locations or the commission at the end of that six months may revoke KPK's license to operate in Colorado. What that means is KPK may continue to operate its location so that it comes into compliance in that six month time frame. But if it is not in full compliance six months from today, the commission may revoke KPK's license to operate completely and it may not do anything at any of its locations. Could you please say that again? The, the yes. last part about what's allowed to operate and what isn't in the time frame that would help me. Thank you. So in, in suspension of certificates of clearance means KPK may not transfer produced product off of its locations. It may not sell product. But it may still operate its locations to come into so that it has can actually in that six month time period attempt to remediate conditions and come into compliance with commission's rules. And one more point of clarification, if I may. When you state that, um, and I think what I, I hear you saying is that, you know, they can continue to do certain things on locations as they're associated with bringing them into compliance. And you specifically stated that they can't, you know, sell products, but you didn't specifically state they can't produce products. So theoretically, under your scenario here, could they bring, you know, product out of the ground, store it in tanks, continue to essentially operate those as producing wells and, and, and store that product. Um, my understanding is that that would not be the case either, that the sites would not be allowed to continue to produce during this time period of suspension. Is that correct? Well, let, if, if I may, I'd like to just read rule 219A, which discusses what a certificate of clearance does. Rule 219A provides the certificate of clearance when approved by the commission constitutes authorization. It's technically authorization to a pipeline or transporter to transport fluid from the well named therein. So what that means is no one can take product off the location and the result being nothing can be sold by KPK. Um, it goes on to state that provided this section, no, sorry, that's not, that's not applicable. So what that, that means is KPK, I'm frankly hesitant to go further than that at this stage, not having had, a, a, as I 
am aware an issue like this before, but what it means is KPK cannot sell product when the certificates of clearance are suspended. Um, perhaps, though I would like to consider this a little bit more, that means that KPK could, I'm gonna stop there and not go any further. Commissioner Ackerman. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification and interpretation, AAG Davenport, really appreciate that. Um, and if that's the case, you know, to my fellow commissioners and Mr. Chair, I would propose that given that many of our concerns associated with this operator are associated with improper handling of materials that have resulted in environmental remediation projects and other spills and issues, if, if, if suspension of their certificates would ostensibly allow them to continue to produce materials and store it on site, I would suggest that we add a uh, stipulation that disallows the production and storage of uh, natural oil and gas natural resources on those sites. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, I would agree with that. I think the only activity that I want to see within the six months, if we're going with six months, is activity that is pertinent to remediation and getting the sites cleaned up, period, end. Commissioner McGowan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And sorry, so this might be a very bad idea. So I will just say that now and feel free to say it's a very bad idea. Um, it's... I feel like KPK has the, this, these older sites that have a lot of issues that we definitely don't want to see production. We don't want to see things store. We want to make sure that it would be nice to get them to remediation and to, in, into compliance. My understanding is that they have other sites, newer wells, where we don't have these compliance issues with them. And maybe that is wrong. But I, if they have no way to sell product from wells that maybe aren't problems for the commission that are in compliance with our rules, um, uh, my guess is we're not going to see them being able to make any progress because they will not have any income coming in. And so I guess what I'm maybe proposing is a splitting of the baby, which I in general do not like, um, where we have limitations on the spindle field operations or these oper these sites um, that they're having so many issues with while they continue to bring in income from sites that don't have problems, but I don't know how we would assure that the income then would be used to continue remediation. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I appreciate um, your thoughts, Commissioner McGowan. Um, that would not be in line with my intent and decision here. Um, I do acknowledge Commissioner Ackerman's concerns about um, problems associated with production. Um, I do think suspension of clearance is, certificates of clearance is appropriate. I do think um, a caveat in there that would um, require wells to be shut in and no production allowed can be included in that. Um, I think that uh, I think that alone, to be to be honest, Commissioner Cross probably does not require then a six month time frame associated with it because if the wells are shut in, if there's no production allowed and remediation can occur, um, then uh, the discouragement or I guess the, the the discouragement to an operator to not comply would be continued continued issuances of NOAVs or, or violations associated with continue non-compliance to COGCC rules. Um, however, um, I can go either way on the six month piece, but I do think wells being shut in and production ceased uh, as well as, um, uh, as a belt and suspenders to the suspension of uh, clearances, um, cl is, is appropriate. AG Davenport, um, did you want to weigh in on these thoughts that are banding about here? 
Yes, I my main suggestion is if the commission chooses to go this route in regard to production, that I would suggest a provision in the order that provides KPK with enough operational ability to at least make sure they shut in safely and do what needs to be done to, um, you know, there may be product in tanks right now or so I, I think the order should provide at least enough operational control by KPK to maintain safety on locations, prevent additional spills, those types of issues. If I may, Mr. Chair, point of clarification on that, Councillor, um, when you're talking about when on your last point, um, I agree with you that we should allow them some flexibility to safely um, you know, ramp down those sites. I just wanted to clarify, you're talking about for material that's, that's already on site, find ways to remove that material safely off site and allow them to do so even through a sales uh, channel, um, but not to produce more uh, on site uh, hydrocarbons. Is that what you're, and, and, and other natural resources? Is that, is that, is my question clear? Yes, it is clear. I think that could be up to the commission if, if KPK has product sitting in tanks right now um, to allow KPK to sell that. Um, that creates some, we can draft that into an order that's possible. Uh, my main concern is just giving KPK enough operational control that they can, can that they can make sure the conditions on locations are safe. Yeah, thanks AAG Davenport. And I, I agree with that. I do think we would need to discuss that a little more. I think it does potentially pre present some enforceability uh, issues, and so we'd have to think of, about that. But I, I also wanted to make a comment about um, how much I appreciate Commissioner McGowan's pragmatism and always um, looking for uh, workable solutions. And wanted to be clear that I am um, that probably that approach also would not be consistent with my recommendation to allow some degree of split continued operations. I, I that, that would not be my recommendation either. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman and uh, Commissioner McGowan. Uh, I appreciate that as well. I, I think we then have yet another three-day hearing to determine which wells are safe to run versus which wells are not. And I think that KPK is, has made its bed and must now lie within it, despite the fact that some of those wells may otherwise not have as much concern. Um. All right. I think what I'd like to do is take a 10 minute break and give AAG Davenport an opportunity to try to collect, collect these thoughts into a uh, written doc that we might be able to share. There's still like one or two points where we don't have consensus in AAG Davenport if you wanted to sort of, get, you know, have either or on those points. But uh, and I'm putting you on the spot here, AG Davenport, but we've never had to do this before. So we are um, trying to do this in as articulate a manner as we can. Uh, is that something that is, is that a mission you'd be willing to accept, AG Davenport? Oh, of course. Uh, if I could have a minor request in maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. However long you think to be able to get something so that we can inform ourselves and the world what is being contemplated. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's return at 3.40. Okay, uh, this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. We are back on docket number 20110261. Uh, we are in deliberations on that matter. AAG Davenport uh, was tasked with uh, putting together our thoughts into something that we could all see. Uh, AAG Davenport, are you in that spot at this point in time? Yes, Mr. Chair, I believe that I am. If you'll give me one moment, I'll share my screen. Okay. Making sure I'm sharing the right one. Okay. 
um, you should all be seeing a Word document that says order provisions. The first item says terminate CPA immediately. Are you all seeing that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, everything that I've written should be on your screen. So there should be no need for me to do any scrolling, et cetera. I'm sorry, I was uh, occupied in something else. What did you just say, Kyle? I said, there's no scrolling to be done. Everything I've written is on the screen right now. Okay, do you just wanna walk through it for us? Sure, so the primary order provisions and obviously a final written order will be significantly more than this. The first is to terminate the CPA immediately. The second is a finding that KPK has not demonstrated substantial compliance with paragraphs two and four through 12 of section four of the CPA. Yeah, I think you wanted to delete the is, has, and just say has not. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, no problem. Un third, unsuspend penalties associated with paragraphs two and four through 12 of section four of the CPA impose the remainder of the initial penalty that's detailed in paragraph one of section four of the CPA. Is that the 795 AJ Davenport? Correct, yes, okay. that's correct. Thank you. Um, unsuspend, sorry, more typos. The unsuspended penalty and remainder of the initial penalty are due within 30 days of the effective date or issuance of the written order. We have not yet discussed a consequence if KPK fails to meet this deadline. Uh, we can do that now, or I can simply go through the, the next two items. Why don't we go through the next two items and then we can turn to consequence. Okay. Um, immediately suspend all certificates of clearance, all of KPK's certificates of clearance. KPK must continue to operate in accordance with commission's rules and COGCC staff has all enforcement options remaining available to it. And finally, KPK has six months from today, I put in today's date, to come into full compliance with commission's rules. If KPK fails to meet this deadline, commission may revoke KPK's license to operate. Okay, um, as to that last sentence, I would suggest removing the word may and the commission will revoke. I don't feel a need in six months to have a hearing on whether we should revoke or not at this point. Commissioners, are you comfortable with that suggested edit? Yes. Okay. And then uh, Kyle, returning to paragraph regarding the payment of the penalties, consequence in event of failure to comply, uh, i.e. they've not paid the penalties within the 30 days of issuance of the written order. Uh, my suggestion is that it's similar, that the commission will revoke KPK's license to operate. What do others think? Agreed. I think you just cut and paste that last sentence there, Kyle, if KPK fails to meet. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, AG Davenport. That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, further thoughts, comments, deliberations concerning what's before us, commissioners? Seeing none, do we have a motion? I will make this motion, Mr. Chair, that we uh, that we take the provisions that have been described to us here by AAG Dav Davenport. Uh, do we need any further detail in that motion, AAG? No, I don't believe so. I, at risk of belaboring this point, it, this will all be put into a final written order that will provide significantly more detail, but will contain these provisions as you've made a motion to approve today. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. 
Second. Commissioner Messner. All right, so we have a motion and a second from Commissioner Cross. Uh, it's now time for discussion of motion. Commissioner Messner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we actually need to have a motion that um, indicates that we find uh, KPK not in substantial compliance with section four of the CPA and will impose these penalties? Hey, AG Davenport. That will certainly be put into a written order. Um, I think it is implied by what the commission has discussed and found here today. Um, if you would like to, just to be clear, to suggest a friendly amendment to Commissioner Ackerman's motion that Commissioner Cross could second if he so chooses, then that's fine as well. Yeah, I'd like to amend the motion and expressly state uh, that we've found them outside of compliance with the CPA. Second. Thank you both, and thank you, Commissioner Messner, for the uh, deliberative thought there. Are there further discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, A.G. Davenport, the written order will be uh, uh, produced by you. Uh, and, and that's in normal course of enforcement matters. Is that right? Yeah, that's um, not necessarily always written by me, but that is um, someone this, within your office. Case, yeah, my office will prepare the written order. I will prepare the written order. And um, the commissioners will have an opportunity to review it okay. in advance of it being issued. Inquiring minds might want to know when that written order might be available. Do, do you have a, a estimate? It'll certainly be at the top of my list, um, but it's going to be significantly, it's going to be a significant order. So um, if I made, or say, two weeks less if directed by the commission. Okay, no, that's fine. I just have a feeling folks are going to wonder about that. Um, okay, uh, that concludes the agenda business for this commission today. Are there any further thoughts from commissioners before we move to adjourn? Then I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Um, second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>